Hello everybody and welcome to part 5 of my Books for Art Inspiration series. If you're new here, my name is Lee Foster Wilson and I'm an artist and illustrator from Cornwall in the UK. In this series I've been talking about books from my own personal collection. My husband and I both went to art school and over the last 20 years or so we've managed to amass quite the collection. There's a lot of art books and other books that have inspired us too and in these videos I share three of them each time and we take a look at what I find so inspiring about them all. So what are we looking at this time around? Well I have a book here that I've had since I was a student and it's full of drawings by a Japanese artist called Yoshitomo Nara and it's got a really in, it's been put together in a really interesting way that I'm really looking forward to sharing with you. And then next we have this book, which is a really fascinating look at the work of the artists behind Disney's mid-century era. And then lastly, we have this lovely big retrospective about the artist Adrian Berg. And if you're into colour and drippy painterly landscapes, then this one is going to be a little treat for you. So let's start with Yoshitomo Nara. As I mentioned previously, I've had this book a long time. I bought it when it was first published in 2001 when I was an art student and I remember being captivated by its celebration of notebook pages and imperfect sketches, which as a whole seem to kind of come together in a story-like exploration of an artist's mind. There's literally nothing in here about Yoshitomo Nara at all even inside the covers I'll show you and I'm loving this cardboard dust jacket too which is just printed all over with his drawings as well as the the cover of the actual book so it leaves this collection of kind of diary like pages there's lots of sketches on tickets and letters and envelopes and notebook pages and you kind of left to kind of take what you will from it and learn about the artists from the work itself and I kind of like that it speaks for itself like the belongings and diaries and objects of rem and remnants of things that we have in our own lives and I kind of feel like it begs the question what would people glean about us if we were to publish our own notes and snippets like this so I've just spotted one, but I should warn you that as I flick through, there are some quite strong bits of language in the book. So I will apologise now that if I happen to land on one of those, um, just so just to show you you're aware that they're there. <laughs> so although this book has nothing written about the artist at all, I've seen Nara's work elsewhere and I do know a little bit more about him. Oh, there's one of those. <laughs> And his work isn't just these scratchy sketches. He also makes sculptures and paintings and they're all of these kind of slightly sinister characters here. And I do know that incidentally they sell like sell for thousands. Oh look, here we go. There's maybe some maquettes for um, some of his sculptures. Puffy girl, puppy, bunny. Um, but yeah, they do sell for a lot of money. He's quite quite popular in certain collector's circles I think um, and they all have this like dreamlike quality which is kind of steeped in weirdness that I kind of really love. I've also read that he likes the idea that picture books can tell a story with just one picture and he tries to bring that kind of suggestion of narrative or to his own work and the characters in his drawings sort of meant to represent emotions and feelings and the conflicting energies that were always that are always present in our lives like this little girl here like she looks quite angry quite unhappy and this one's kind of she looks quite serene but i'm not sure what she's meant to be holding here and this dog he's really cute but he's got this spiky collar on with a lot of sparkles coming off it and I find that this book is like a real brain dump of ideas and I really love that. I kind of like that art can be found as much in the ideas waiting to be formed into final art as it can be found in the final art itself. The fun thing about this particular book though 
I'll show you now, is the way that it's been printed. It's kind of printed on this quite light, uncoated paper stock, which is kind of evocative of cheap notebooks, really. And it leads you through these pages of sketches by sometimes printing on both sides of a sheet as it would have appeared in real life. So like here on one side, you have the drawing and you can see the other drawing kind of bleeding through from the image at the back. And then you turn the page and here's the image that you could see as a ghost on the previous page, this little upside down girl, they're both upside down, like they're kind of floating downwards, I guess, the bubbles coming up. It kind of has that sort of happy accident feel to it. And is this one there, I'll try and find another one. That's the end of the book. I'll try and find another one of those examples. Hold on, there are lots, but there you go. Here's some more of them, not that one. Just here is another one. You can see this little girl with her strange suction hands coming through the page here. But yeah, like I was saying, it kind of has this sort of happy accident feel to it. And I love the idea that what you see on the front of an art piece isn't all that it is. There's always more behind it, more that came before it, and more that will come after it too. And another thing I love about this book is the random written things as well. This one says, one of America's greatest pleasures is drinking Coke and reading eight ball. Like I look at my own notebooks and there are a lot of random snippets waiting to be used. Galaxy and stars, one way ticket. I wonder what that's about. But yeah, lots of random snippets waiting to be used. And at the time I wrote them down, they had context and meaning. And now when I look back at them, they kind of make, no sense whatsoever. And here it's the same. There are some diarised entries, thoughts on things happening in the world, and then just random notes and words. Some of them are in Japanese, so obviously I can't read those. But we can only presume where they came from or even what they led to. Here we go, here's another one of those examples. Nobody knows, but I know you know. And on the back, I'm not sure what that is meant to be. 35 millimeter film is obviously having some thoughts about what to film or take pictures of. But yeah, this book kind of makes me think of all the hundreds of things that people think of and say every day and all the stuff on the internet, the billions of images and opinions that are uploaded every day and then how as people were kind of hardwired into this push and pull of like internal thought and external information and consumption and production. So while there isn't much about the artist or any explanation of the art itself, somehow this book manages to be really thought provoking and an inspiring thing to ponder over every so often and one that I thoroughly enjoy having to hand. Like this thought on time. As time passes by, it suddenly slashes across the screen of my eyes, or sometimes gets pressed flat like a flower. I want to snag it for good with my drawings. Time passes by before it fades and vanishes. I want to grab it a bit and make it last. Sometimes it's a diary I draw, drawn over and over so I don't forget. Imagination doesn't stop for the past of the future, or the future. And that's what makes me both happy and sad. Yoshitomo Nara. I think that's quite a a good insight into his work really and the nature of these drawings in this book. Just grabbing at bits and pieces that are happening. It's a really beautiful drawing in it too. So yeah, this is just one that I love having around and having to dip back in and out of really makes me think about things. Here's another one of those pages. With this big black square on one side. And this funny little drawing of somebody sitting on a plaster on that side, which I did see a more finished version of further back through. So yeah, that's that one. That's Yoshitomo Nara, Nobody Knows. It's published in 2001. You can still get copies of it. They're around and about for very wildly varying prices. I did have a look. So next up, we have an entirely different book. B. 
the hidden art of Disney's mid-century era. And this is by Didier Getz, or Getz. And it is one of the books in a series all about the artists behind Disney. The whole series is called They Drew As They Pleased and it chronicles the studio's output from the 1930s through to the 2010s through essays and interviews and most importantly lots of lovely artworks in the form of sketches and storyboards and character development. It's really interesting. So this one in particular covers the 1950s and 60s and I have to admit I've not read it from cover to cover but I have dipped in and out of some of the essays and interviews and I love this book in particular because it covers the era of Mary Blair. That's one of Mary Blair's works, whose work I just really love. It also covers her husband, Lee Blair, and a few other of Disney's artists as well. We'll have a quick look at all of them. So I'll have a flick through and just talk about what it is I like about the imagery in this book. Because um, there's quite a lot to absorb. It's quite a thick, a thick book but there's lots of different styles and sketches and the like. And what I particularly like is it's kind of like a look behind the Disney curtain at all the unfinished work that went into creating such iconic animations and how the artists figure out, figured out the scenes and gave them so much energy. So we'll have a look first at Lee Blair. And he did these sketches for Pinocchio. Let me get to them. There's lots of history of them all, which is really interesting. But there's just the beautiful sketchiness to these pack, these pieces, just working everything out. And there's so much energy. I mean, look at all the energy in these. This is all for Pinocchio. I just love this. This big custard pie smash in the face. Food and cutlery and crockery just flying everywhere. There's so much detail, just even in the sketches here. Look at this one. Poor old Pinocchio. I think living in an age where we see so much content and quite often just the finished product, it's really interesting in a book like this and the Yoshitomo Nara too to see what goes on behind the scenes to make such big visions come to life. These ones are from Fantasia. And these are probably all just like sketches for the background of something. Oh, from Fantasia as well. So much thought and imagination in all of them. So here is the Mary Blair section. She is one of my favourite artists in this book. And the atmosphere and her colours and her use of light, even in her sketches, is just exquisite. Just, um, yeah, just look at these ones here. They're beautiful. The light on the water. You can just feel how still that is, can't you? But with this sort of stormy grey weather coming in across the horizon. And this long one here, you can imagine the camera panning across. It's like it's one long scene as the characters kind of go along this railway track. That was from um, The Three Caballeros. Or Caballeros, I don't know how you pronounce that. <laughs> I don't, I've not seen that film. But yeah, this scene is just full of these beautiful jewel-like kind of exotic plants. And I do think the backgrounds in animations are probably the things we don't really notice when you're watching all the action take place. But if they weren't good or they weren't there, we'd soon notice. They kind of have to play this really important scene-setting role. These are really sweet, aren't they? These lovely little horses. I just think these sketches are so beautiful. These ones are from Dumbo and it's just the lighting and the atmosphere that I love so much. Oh, I found Dumbo quite traumatic when I did watch it. I haven't watched it for so long. I think, and I've not even shown it to my children. I think they'd find it too upsetting. But here we go. There's lots of character development. These lovely little scenes here. More of these beautiful jewel colours in these sketches. And these are classic mid-century things going on up here. It's got a real vibe to it, I love it. 
more character development. And these are all character designs for Cinderella. I did read that apparently they wanted Cinderella to originally be animated in Mary Blair's style, but the animators um, were a bit stuck in the mud and a bit curmudgeonly and they kind of refused to make it happen. But they, the characters did in the end sort of have her kind of style to them, but they couldn't do it in her sort of more painterly way like this, which is sad, I think, because I just think they're lovely. But these, these ones here, I just absolutely adore them. I can't even put my finger on what it is that I actually love about them so much, but I think it lies somewhere between the brushy lines paired with like the flat colour and just the magical castles and buildings and colours. They're just so beautiful to me. And this one here, look at this. It's just stunning. And here's some more character development. And I absolutely love this one for Alice in Wonderland. It's also the cover of the book. Just great use of colour and atmosphere and perspective. I love these trees in the background. More Alice in Wonderland. This looks like a early thing for cars. Did you see that film? My children have loved cars, um, but with the little cars and their eyes and their talking mouths and living in this town. It's all very, uh, <laughs> very strange, <laughs> but they loved it. And this looks like it's sort of something early for that, even done in the 50s and 60s. And here's some Peter Pan work too. Just love these. The colour treatment of that is just so evocative. It kind of lies somewhere between the Aurora Borealis and some kind of spooky swamp. Just wonderful. And next we have the work of Tom Oreb. I think that's how you pronounce it. Oreb or Oreb. And this section features a lot of really fun character design. And it just makes you realise how much has to be considered when they're making feature length films. Isn't that a beautiful drawing? Sleeping Beauty. But yeah, every single pose and expression. And of course, this was before computers, so it all had to be worked out by hand to pass on to the animators. And there's just some lovely classic mid-century stuff going on here too. Look at that horse's feet. So much fun. <laughs> 101 Dalmatians. I love this cat here too. These are all character studies for Cinderella. These classic mid-century vibes going on. Loving this. So yeah, that's Tom Oreb. Move on. So much character stuff going on. A real energy to it. So then we have John Dunn, and I love how all of these artists have their own distinctive styles. And some of John Dunn's work, let me find it, reminds me of, where has it gone? Here it is, Ol Excel, who I spoke about in the last books video. You may have seen it already. Um, it's just, you might want to check that out as well. It's just this sparse line work mixed with the colour and the wacky characters. It's just so good this guy standing on his own nose <laughs> more storyboarding and we all recognize this guy don't we Donald Duck and now we come to Walt Perigoy whose work I love probably just as much as Mary Blair's actually these scenery and the scene setting and the colors he used and the light is just so beautiful I find it so appealing. Just look at the shadows and the light in this. It's just beautiful. We've got this lovely shaft of sunlight coming through and then the kind of gloom in the background. And here we go. Where are we? Here we are. Just trying to find the right pages for you. 
just the simplicity of it. This is for 101 Dalmatians. Beautiful. The simple kind of blocks of colour that just tell you so much about what the light is like in this place and the perspective as well. You're kind of down on the floor. Look, there's the door handle. You're looking up this magnificent set of stairs that's kind of really intriguing but also really spooky. And I love these ones, these jungle book ones especially. They're so beautiful. Imagine the action taking place as the camera pans along. And there's Mowgli just there. And there he is again, hiding with his torch. Just the simplicity in them. <clears throat> just evokes so much atmosphere. Really beautiful. And so the book just finishes up with some of these sort of ink and pencil drawings of his. A bit of character design. And coloured pencil use here. So yeah, this is just another really gorgeous book. Another one that's great for dipping in and out of. And you can take so much from it, from the landscape and characters and colour and use of light and atmosphere creation, all of that really. I do have another of the books from this um, this series, the They Drew As They Please series, with two which I'll share another time. That one's from sort of later on in the 19th, 19th 20th century <laughs> and um, into the early 2000s. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed that one. And next, lastly, but definitely not leastly, or least <laughs> we have this one which is a fairly new to me book I bought it last year after seeing the work of Adrian Berg in the World of Interiors magazine and I just knew I needed a more permanent slice of this painterly magic in my house so uh, a couple of days later this turned up in a parcel so this lovely book is a retrospective of Berg's work and like all retrospectives it has lots of writing about the artist's life as well as the paintings and the artworks which are like a full-on colourful cacophony. They're brilliant and it was definitely the colour that drew me to his work when I first saw it in the magazine. Hot pinks, can't say no to that. <laughs> there are, it starts off obviously being a retrospective with some of his early works and his landscapes which are just undeniably beautiful sort of an exploration of the seasons and other bits and pieces really lovely work but it gets a bit more interesting for me when you get to this section of the book which they call the Regent's Park years where he started to paint the view from his studio window and I just love them. I think they have this really dreamy quality to them, like they've been painted from life, but also from memory. And I particularly love this one, which apparently could be hung at any angle on the wall. And there's a few of these kind of paintings in the book. I think he, it's the sort of concept he worked with quite regularly. And I just love the idea that a landscape painting could be enjoyed from whatever view you want it to be enjoyed of. Much like when we kind of walk through a park, our perceptions of it differs from whichever gate we happen to enter the park from. So like the same trees and fences and benches and shrubs will look different if approached from one angle compared to another. And I just feel like that's such an interesting concept to ponder and to kind of bring into your art as well. So that you can look at it from whatever angle you like best, I suppose. Um, yeah, there's a few more of those throughout the book and you'll see them as we go through. I'll try and point some of them out. Just, yeah, really interesting concept to me. And I just find that this work is just a really great celebration of that which we kind of mostly overlook, much like the painterly background scenes in the Disney book, the ones that I love from that. These paintings kind of place the trees and plant life and the seasons that form the backdrop to our lives onto a podium and in the spotlight. I think this is another one of those um, park paintings that can be any which way up you like it to be. It's kind of a really nice way of abstracting a landscape without kind of um, losing too much of the, the more realistic details, I guess. 
So yeah, quite often the paintings kind of depict city parks. You can see the fences along here and other urban green spaces, but they're always devoid of any people, even though you can see traces of people because they sometimes have structures so like here and pathways and fences. But I feel like that, that only just goes to highlight the beauty of the nature around those structures, I think. I guess, yeah. I just also love that he paints the same place in different seasons too, sometimes putting more than one season into the work as well. The colours in this are just so beautiful. Imagine in real life they're really rich and vibrant. They probably kind of hum together, like these blues and oranges probably really sort of react against each other. I'd love to see them in real life. So much detail, look at that. So yeah, as you go through, so there's one with more than one season. It's kind of the same scene throughout the year. And then there are these really beautiful watercolours. This is Derwent Water from Walla Crag. 1989 and then there's a few coastal ones as well I think this is another one that can be hung up any which way and it's very prolific and we start seeing the introduction of these reflective pieces so I guess maybe they were influenced by his time up at the lakes but um yeah these reflections here we go they're kind of like, um, it's a bit different, those ones. Hang on. Let me find what I'm talking about. More coastal ones. They are really lovely too. Where are we? Here we go. Yeah, I really like these. Where he sort of draws on the reflection. It's kind of like you've got this mirror image. And I also kind of think they kind of look like a, a sort of an upside down spot. The difference It's the difference, isn't there, with the... The landscape that you can see and then the reflected landscape or that even if it's like a perfect reflection there's always some kind of ripple on the water that makes it appear slightly different and you can see that in the colors that's like more muted slightly less detailed and here we go some more reflections i don't know what it is it just really make my heart go oh isn't that lovely <laughs> So yeah, and then we're moving on. These go get a bit more dribbly. I'm trying to find specific ones. Where are they? Aha, here we go. These ones that he drew, at, drew painted at Kew Gardens. Or maybe he drew them and then painted them at home. Who knows? But <laughs> um, yeah, I just really like the contrast between the structure of the glass house. It kind of reminds me of the Eden Project here in Cornwall. It's like a, it's like a real beautiful tension between the structure of the of the temperate biomes and then all this beautiful lush greenery underneath it i wonder if that's kind of the sort of thing he was trying to get across with these as well going back to the wrong place the man-made structure and then this lush nature underneath there's real energy to them and then we have some more reflections. They're a bit more dribbly than the other ones, these ones. I really love how the paint kind of dribbles from the sort of small solid landscape up above into the bit that is the reflection on the water, kind of emphasizing the wateriness. This one, this one's very dribbly. So is that one. Here we have the sky dribbling down as well. I'm trying to find a particular one, but maybe I won't be able to find it. Let me see. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I just really, I love how this, this is so simple and solid looking and then underneath, so dribbly and watery, this one, this is the one I really love. It's that pop of pink as well amongst all the blues and greens and yellows and mauves. Just stunning. And then there's the other ones with water in them as well. These ones here. 
where the water kind of takes on this almost like graphic quality, sort of a, a graphic abstract edge to it, which I do wonder it was maybe influenced by David Hockney, who is one of his lifelong friends and who obviously famously obsessed over depictions of water. You kind of wonder if that kind of that influence seeped into Adrian Berg's work a bit. Who knows? But yeah, this is just a beautiful book, book a proper celebration of landscape and paint and colour. And another one that I just love to come and dip back into and delight in. Really stunning. So that's that one. So there we have it. Another three books from my collection. This one's quite heavy. <laughs> If you enjoyed them, please do leave me a comment letting me know why and what it was you liked particularly about them. And don't forget to give the video a thumbs up as well. And if you really liked it, please do come and subscribe for more arty book chat and creative offerings. I'll see you next time.